As we enter this second week of Advent, we think about peace. Peace not as the absence of conflict, but rather peace as, as that deep centering when Jesus is truly at the center of our lives. And despite anything that's going on around us, brings us that sense of comfort and, and security that you and I might call peace. We would think that peace would be a, a natural result of the hope that we talked about last week. Trusting and believing that God is at work in our world, in our lives, in ways that will ultimately set us free. Last week we talked about the fact that we are all broken and that it's God's love that is the glue that has mended us together and that every one of those lines of mending is in fact a sacred scar, a symbol of the new life that we have in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And out of that comes hope, and, and we hope that the natural offshoot is peace. But the truth is that for so many of us so often, especially these days, what we're experiencing, what we're feeling, is a disconnect that peace seems to elude us and that we are often overcome by the anxiety and the emotions that we're feeling because there is so much going on around us and in so many ways we feel powerless and helpless and completely overwhelmed and for too many of us we have taken on an identity of being alone in this world. Especially for those of us who are living alone during this pandemic and, and cannot have the, the activity or the interaction with other people that we, that we thrive on. Aloneness and loneliness are pretty close. And for those of us who feel truly alone or left out or abandoned. Peace is a very fleeting thing. In today's gospel, according to Mark, we hear the very beginning of his gospel. And I hope that you heard how he begins to tell the story of Jesus Christ from his perspective. He begins like this. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There's no beautiful manger scene. There are no shepherds. There's no great genealogy like there is in the Matthew uh, Gospel. There's no beautiful poetic imagery like there is in John's Gospel. Mark gets right to the point. He wants us to know from the outset why he was t is telling this story and who this story is about and that it matters. It really matters. And if we could describe Mark's story of Jesus in one phrase or one sentence, perhaps we would say that in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the source of all life itself, confronts every source of death that exists in creation and confronting these things he does. Mark's gospel is, is short and compact with few descriptive words. Mark gets right to the point. It's a fast-paced gospel that tells the story of Jesus from the time that he shows up and is baptized all the way through his death and resurrection. And as we read through this story, and I encourage you to do that, it's a short story. I encourage you to sit down and read the Gospel of Mark from beginning to end in one sitting. And what you will see is Jesus confronting and confronting and confronting. He confronts those who are sick. 
and heals them, relieves them of all the sickness that has held them back and that has been so death dealing in their lives. He makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak and the paralyzed to, to get their lives back and to be able to leap and dance and live again. He confronts whatever it is that is holding them back. And many times in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is confronting and confronted by demons. These sources of evil that have invaded God's good creation and who have taken over some of God's beloved people and who have caused so much deadness in them, so much agony in them, so much disconnection from the gift of life that God intends for them to have. And Jesus confronts them and names them and tells them to get lost and frees those people who have been victimized by those demons for too long. And Jesus confronts those whose disbelief is getting in the way of them receiving this great gift of abundant life that is his and only his to offer. And Jesus confronts those religious systems. You remember the story of him walking into the temple and completely disrupting everything, letting the sacrificial animals out of their cages and overturning tables and shouting at the top of his lungs, do not make my father's house a den of thieves. He confronts the religious systems and those who participate and create those systems that take advantage of God's people, that don't bring them closer to God, but that instill fear in them and manipulate them so that their religious leaders can become more powerful and wealthier at the expense of these people who they are called to love and to serve and to shepherd. And then at the end of his gospel, in the grand finale, Jesus confronts death itself. He dies on that cross, calling out to God the Father to forgive them, to forgive us because we just don't understand. And on the third day, God raises him from death back to life again, and death is conquered once and for all. Throughout this beautiful, fast-moving gospel, we see the Son of God seeing what is wrong, confronting it, and freeing those who have been held hostage for far too long. You and I, listening to these stories, we can only imagine what those freed people must have felt, what the rest of their lives must have looked for when everything that had kept them captive had been destroyed and they were finally set free to live, to really live. Mark's gospel was composed for a community of early Christians who were under extreme persecution by the Roman Empire. These early believers, none of whom actually met Jesus, this gospel was written far too much and after Jesus' death and resurrection for anyone to have been alive when he was. But they'd heard the stories, they'd heard the witnesses from people who knew him and they believed, and their lives were changed forever. And yet, they were persecuted for their faith. Imagine actually risking your life by claiming Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And this community for whom Mark wrote this gospel was dealing with some really difficult questions. And they are many of the same questions that you and I wonder about today. For example, if Jesus' death and resurrection overcame death, why is peace so hard to find? And the answer? 
that Mark tells us and that our experience tells us is that we are living in this period of time called the already but not yet. That God came into creation in a new way, that Jesus was the firstborn of God's new creation, and that in that moment of his birth, God began this great project of reconciling all of creation to himself. But God's not finished yet. His project is not yet complete. And so you and I, and the first Christian believers so long ago, live in this in-between time, wrestling with these forces of evil and, and destruction and death that still are at work in creation. And yet we trust and believe and hope in the promise that in the death and resurrection of Jesus, death really was swallowed up forever. It's just that we've got a little bit longer to wait until we see God face to face and know how true that truth is. And as we wait in hope, it is very, very easy for us to get caught up in the anxiety that we feel with everything that's going on around us, with pandemics and politics and unemployment and an economy that is tottering and everything else that's happening around us as we stay close to home, wearing masks and socially distancing, trying to do everything in our power to stay out of harm's way and healthy. And so peace can seem awfully fleeting to us these days. But I wonder if we could begin to think of peace a little bit differently, perhaps we might be able to access this great gift that we have in our relationship with Jesus Christ. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And what it really means is on both an individual and a community basis, peace exists when we can feel that sense of completeness, of rightness, of wholeness, of being fulfilled not by careers or bank accounts or anything else in this world, but simply by the fullness of our relationship with Jesus Christ, the grace that he gives us, the forgiveness that he offers us the life that we live because of him. We might also think of peace in terms of harmony, harmony in our families, in our communities, in our church, a sense of security, of well-being, despite everything that's going on around us. So how do we who live in such a chaotic world in which there is so much anxiety and we so often can feel so powerless and helpless. How can we come to that place of accessing and holding on to peace? Well, I would suggest that it starts with trusting God and the promises that God has made to us. That his love is stronger than anything creation can ever throw at us. But coming to a point of being able to say that we truly experience that deeply felt and held peace also involves some intentional work on our part. It truly doesn't just happen. There are tools at our disposal. There are practices that we can use. There are strategies that are available to us as individuals and as a community to be able to access this great and life-giving gift of peace. And so let's talk for a moment about some of those strategies. 
the one that I think of first when I am feeling tied up in knots or anxious or afraid is the gift of breath. The gift of how our body can relax all the tension that, that lives within us by simply using the breath that God has given us. The breath that's necessary for life itself. And so we might practice deep breathing. You might try it right now as we take a deep cleansing breath in, maybe close our eyes and take a deep cleansing breath in and hold it and then slowly let it out through our mouths. We can feel the tension just go right out of our, our feet and the ends of our hands. And as we practice this deep breathing, we might visualize that beautiful story in the second chapter of Genesis where God creates the man out of mud, this man who is an inanimate object, until God breathes his own breath into that man's lungs. And suddenly he breathes for the first time and he lives. So deep breathing is a wonderful strategy to to help our bodies relax, to help us center ourselves once again, to visualize and to feel that sense of that goes through the core of our body when we take a deep breath in and let it out. For some of us, journaling is a wonderful exercise to begin to get a sense of peace. When there's so much that's on our minds these days, to be able to just open up a journal or even go on the computer and just write what we're thinking, write what we're feeling, and then go back and read what we've written and ask ourselves, where did I see God at work in that moment or in this day? Journaling can involve writing, it can involve drawing or painting, it can involve cutting pictures out of magazines, it doesn't matter. But the very act of, of putting down on paper some of what our experience has been during the day, especially those experiences that have caused us anxiety and a lack of peace, can help us to have it laid out in front of us and we can, can begin to see where God was moving through our day, moving through those hard moments. And we can take a deep breath and we can breathe in his presence and his love and his grace. And we can feel peace. Another tool that involves journaling is starting a gratitude journal. Gratitude is a close cousin to, to hope and peace. And by simply having the discipline of writing down each night before you go to bed or any time during the day, just writing down one or two things for which you are feeling grateful in that moment can reorient us back towards the one who blesses us richly each and every day. There's a tool called a feelings wheel that I'm going to post on our Facebook page and also on our website on the sermons page. And I would encourage you, if you're finding that your feelings are roiling around inside of you and sometimes they're confusing and often they're painful, I would encourage you to take a look at this feelings wheel because it's one way of, of seeing on paper how we think we're feeling and then going deeper and deeper and deeper until we discover what we're really feeling. And when we truly get in touch with what's deep inside of us that's causing us to not have peace, then we can begin to look at that 
and reorient that feeling back to recognize that Jesus is present in that and will walk us through it. So I encourage you to take a look at that feelings wheel. You can even print it out if you want to and use it as we walk through these long days and nights of pandemic when everything is so uncertain and peace seems to be awfully far away. And last, another tool we have is of course prayer and music. For many of us, putting on a playlist from Spotify or Pandora or playing a CD, if you still use CDs, of quiet reflective music or even the sound of rain can help us to quiet ourselves, to just listen to that music and then maybe sit and meditate for a while or open scripture and read your favorite psalm while the music plays or just sit in God's presence. All of these tools are here for us so that we can feel empowered at a time when we often feel powerless. So that our hope can lead us to peace and ultimately lead us to joy. I will post a number of resources to help you find peace on Facebook and on our website so that you can have those to explore and to work with. And let's not forget the importance of the connections we have with each other. That when we're feeling most alone in the world, that sometimes all it takes is picking up the phone or even sending a text message and hearing that voice back from someone who we know really deeply cares about us. We can be Christ to each other in these days of pandemic in these days of loss and grief and anxiety. And in those deep connections we have with each other, we will find our deep connection, not only with ourselves, but with the one who came to live and die and be raised from death to life so that you and I can have eternal life. And so my prayer for you as we move through this Advent season, now from hope to peace and next week moving towards joy is that you will find that space and reorient yourself toward the one who loves you, who has claimed you as his own in the water of baptism, who has fed you with his own body and blood, and who has promised that he's got you and that he will never, ever let you go. Thanks be to God. Amen.